And then I think we might actually be able to make C3 to C4 level giant stats, but not just from understanding the existing gene. I want to take your train on this uh, issue of diversity, which I find it, if I can call it, biological enigma. I don't find evidence to suggest that that is always good, because you also concluded that you may not maximize the benefits, but the risk. And let me give you an example. Um, rice system, for example. If you look at the biological productivity or economic productivity on a per day basis, it's highest than you can get in any natural system where you have huge diversity. And I, I myself worked in a number of years in microbes, and we used to compare cultivated soils with non-cultivated soils. We find a lot of diversity in non-cultivated soil but cultivated soil is much more productive. So I, I really don't know. And yeah, there, I mean, there are similar examples. Uh, another study from Tillman you know, looking at uh, nitrogen addition and nitrogen addition to natural grasslands increases productivity but decreases diversity. So it's certainly possible to break that link. In agriculture, some of you may be familiar with takeoff decline, where if you grow continuous wheat, you get this nasty fungus called takeoff. But if you keep growing continuous wheat, it goes away. And that was seen at Rothenstead, I think, for the first time, but it's at first, but it's also been seen in Australia and uh, I think in, in the Palouse as well. So there certainly are counter examples to the idea that greater diversity is always going to give you greater stability, productivity. You know, and, and so on. So, really what I'm saying is, I think this issue of diversity is one that we need to take seriously, that we need to do experiments that are not designed to, you know, whenever I have a, a new graduate student that says, I want to do an experiment to prove X. And I say, no, you don't. You want to do an experiment to find out whether X. And that's the approach we need to take in, in looking at diversity, what's, you know, what are the relationships, and how do we look at diversity in space and time, different spatial scales, and all that stuff. How are we going to overcome market forces and stupid political decisions? When, when I look at my area where I grew up in Germany, in that village, when I grew up, uh, there were sophisticated crop rotations, many crops, all kinds of things. Uh, nowadays, there's only four crops, wheat, canola, maize, yeah. and the fourth one I already forgot, it already is one existent, the three basically. Yeah. So all the other crops have disappeared primarily because uh, uh, they weren't competitive anymore or compared to other cheaper resources of that coming into Germany once the EU got established in particular. Yeah. And the last big change happened starting about three years ago uh, when a big commercial biogas unit was uh, installed uh, and requires maize, green maize, as the feedstuff. Yeah. Because it's highly subsidized uh, renewable energy in Germany, which is a big stupid system. But, so we're screwing up essentially agriculture everywhere in the world because of these things. Yeah. So is there any way to actually turn back the wheel of time or not? Well, I think that's a, that's a really big problem. I mean, when, when Wheat fails because there's this, you know, global, what's this, this new wheat thing that's running around? Uh, or, yeah. Or, or, you know, when uh, potatoes fail because you know, late light you know, spreads, spreads throughout the world, those of us who are growing buckwheat and sunflower are going to get a really high price for our crop. But if you as an individual farmer, you know, do the risk-benefit analysis, you're going to say, we would be better off if there was a greater diversity of crops in the region. That would minimize the risk that they're all going to fail at once. It would minimize the risk of us having a regional famine. 
why don't you grow up wheat? <laughs> so, I mean, you, you, you've identified the problem exactly. Unless the, the, the level of diversity, which is socially optimal, or optimal for the benefits of us collectively, is not the same level of diversity that we'll get from individual farmers making their own decisions in the current regulatory, incentive, subsidy environment. So I, I think we're not going to get a change in that without a change in the subsidy, regulation, incentive patterns that we have. I was just wondering whether you could put this diversity and try to make it more scientific. When you think about the rationale behind diversity, it's what to do with genetic variation for ad adaptation to the different micro environments you get, whether they're different levels of cold or different diseases and the associated toilet students. So, so then, what we've been doing for many years is calculating components of variance on the plant side, the genetic variance, the new value variance, and the environmental variance. With that information, it's quite easy to construct <coughs> different scenarios with different types of environmental variation where sometimes monoculture comes out on top, sometimes intercropping comes out on top, and sometimes rotations come out on top. It all depends on the pattern of environmental variation and how you organize the genetic variation by the crops or the green crops. Don't, don't you need some term in that analysis for you know, the interactions between the, the, the species? Yeah. So and that's part of making a scientific-based model where you've got, you're modeling the, the match between environmental microclimate and the crop or genotype within the crop that is matched that environment. You can design optimally diverse or optimally uniform farming systems depending on which aspects of the environment you maintain the uniform and which you would expect to do. Can't we make the whole thing more scientific and, and therefore come back to this bigger political issue if we pick up with some evidence? That's a great idea, and, and when you submit the paper to nature, you suggest me as a reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> How many years do you have of the requirement? <laughs> Long term study? Get going. Uh, more questions. Do you actually think that we understand the genetic variation that we have in our monocultures? I'm not completely disappointed. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was thinking of your example of the Rockham study experiment where yeah. from out of the blue, got resistance all of a sudden appearing in wheat to a pathogen. Oh no. The, the the change is actually a change in the soil microbes, not a change in the wheat. But I was also thinking of um, uh, one of my colleagues' experiments where they they had genetic diversity in their <coughs> soil pots and for, they either used cloned species um, to make up the diversity or they used seed where they didn't know what the genetic diversity mm -hmm. was, and as you follow those over the longer term, it was the ones that had the genetic diversity within the species um, that were more successful. Yeah. And I just wonder whether we have that sort of diversity. We know we have that diversity in rice um, within any one accession. And do we actually understand what role that's actually playing? No, that's a, good, that's a good question. And also, you know, we certainly have the possibility of, of varietal mixtures where you have the varieties that have similar sort of agronomic traits and harvesting and so on, but have different disease resistance genes. And one of the reviews of my book suggested that I you know, might have given you know, short, too short shrift to that, uh, that approach and suggested some papers that I should look at, and so I'll be doing that. How important is the genome scale variation? Let's say uh, uh, IR8, when it was released, had two of the land races, right? two or three, or three, or three uh, in its pedigree. So the modern varieties that we are breeding nowadays typically have between 25 and more than 30 in the pedigree. But they 
it's still difficult. Yeah, so uh, my question is uh, bringing in more genetic diversity, if you wish, uh, by widening the, the pedigree, does that matter much or not from a longer term perspective? I, I think from a diversity perspective, is it not the form of diversity that matters much? I think somebody else could probably answer that better. I mean, if it's, uh, if, if you've got a diploid uh, species, I mean, if, if the, if the, the diversity that's key to you know some kind of disease resistance or something is what allele you have at some particular locus. Then in a diploid species, you, you can only have two at that locus, and and the only way to get more is either to have a polyploid or to have another genotype there. So then the question is, well, okay, but well, what about diversity? You know, across the whole genome, can that can that Solve the problem, or do you have to have diversity at locus X? And I'm sure other people will be able to answer that very well. Well, anybody else would like to, who would like to comment or question? Hey, yeah, you can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> My mic. Wait, wait, microphone's on. Well, recently we, we started to uh, experiment creating uh, population that uh, probably addressed that promote the combination in the genome. So we get the almost like grinding the genome in a final way. Uh, so I don't have a plant with a very large number of donors? Uh, multiple right? donors and also uh, uh, multiple cycle of the combination. Yeah. So more so a breeding program are uh, uh, two parental cross and then the very All right. So actually you have time, you can go down to the, the, the drive, uh, the grid drive. At the end of the world, you see some of those material, and they are very diverse. Uh, so that's one, one, one aspect. Using more parents uh, will give you inter locus uh, diversity, I think. not same locus, but two of uh, The other thing I'd like to bring up is that, is that um, there are also um, uh, diversity in, in some way that, that you may I'll give you one example. Recently, uh, you cited uh, uh, Sue's paper on the interplant. Yeah. He happened to be, he was here just a week before he came. Oh. If I knew that uh, you would put it together. Uh, the reason I bring this up is, is that they have a system in Yunnan province that where the, the land race is up in the rice terraces, for some reason, uh, very stable <coughs> in disease and when they investigate it, it out, it's not really diverse. I mean, there are patches of genotypes, but the, the population evolved mechanism to deal with this disease and not the standard one gene or one gene type of uh, disease. So, what might you say the population being the plant population or the human population? I think the, the, the plant population. Okay. So, so one suggesting that in certain ecosystems, the plant may have evolved a mechanism to deal with the stress and, and, and use, they could be a diverse, uh, they could be multiple genotypes in the community. They're not mixture, they're, they're planted as pure stand, but then within the village, there are multiple patches like that. So, so that uh, paper you cited in the planting uh, has evolved over 10 years time into mosaic planting. So that's, I think if we, we have a chance, that, that would be a really nice case study. Yes. See how they manage the disease and, and also uh, stabilize the production system by using multiple genotypes in patches, not in the mixture that uh, they established. Right, but that, that mosaic pattern is, is the result of human choices. Yes. It's not some uh, system where you, you know, threw out a bunch of genotypes, and let ecological and environmental, ecological and evolutionary processes happen, and that led naturally to a mosaic. It's something that humans have have done, and it would be an example of the kind of thing that I think we ought to be investigating. But, but the, the human knows it's over thousands of years. This rice terrace is like very long history. So generation over generation, the the, the family knows about what kind, or the neighbors. 
So that type of knowledge was sort of passed on, and then that lead to a system fairly stable and fairly high. Yield. Those rice terraces yielding four times a hectare. That's only in Yunnan province, because they are high, they have good sunlight and long duration. So, so there's a lot to be learned in those sort of diverse systems, but not necessarily. It's still fairly uh, intense on the culture, but then have a system where, where, uh, where promote that diversity. Yeah, I like, I like cash based diversity as something to explore. Good, I think we'll stop here. Uh, more is been around until tomorrow. Yep. Anybody has uh, further examples to bring up that could either support uh, these principles or challenge them or add new ones to that, uh, please uh, contact him either in person or by email. And I'm sure he'll be happy to respond. Other than that, please uh, let's give him another big hand for.